Good evening. I would like to welcome all of you to the sixth Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. My name is Hilary Garner, and I will be serving as the moderator for this session. I would like to remind everyone to please sign into the poll everywhere. Uh, this is an interactive webinar, so we would love to get your responses to some of the questions that Dr. Samim will pose to you uh, throughout his talk. Um, and uh, Furthermore, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, for this webinar, Dr. Mohamed Samin, who is an assistant professor of radiology at New York University Langone Medical Center. He joined the MSK faculty at NYU five years ago after completing his diagnostic radiology residency at Yale University School of Medicine, and then his fellowship in MSK and interventional radiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. His special interests in MSK are hip and post-operative imaging, as well as musculoskeletal tumors and interventions. Um, also some of my favorite topics within MSK as well. So we certainly have a lot in common. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Samin to get started. Uh, hello everyone. Thanks uh, Dr. Garner for your uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for having me. I'm going to just share my screen. So I'm gonna talk about how to perform um, an image guided biopsy in an MSK. Okay, very good. So I have no disclosures. Uh, so within the next 40 minutes or so, I am going to go over some principles of image guided bone and soft tissue biopsy, uh, tips on performing biopsies accurately and safely and how uh, to avoid some uh, more common pitfalls. Uh, so image guided biopsies are uh, very well established. They're minimally invasive, they're cost effective um, for definitive histological diagnosis of soft tissue and bone lesions. Uh, they are pretty safe and uh, with high diagnostic yield and accuracy, um, uh, almost it gets sometimes between 74 to 99% and then 70 to 99% in the soft, in the bone and soft tissue and soft tissue and bone respectively. But in order to perform these procedures safely while avoiding complications um, and achieving high diagnostic accuracy, um, performing radiologists really needs to um, have a well thought plan and technique. Um, therefore, it is really critical to have a consistent process of doing a biopsy and going through the process consistent, consistently, consistently for every referral that you're getting. So um, if I want to divide the process into three steps, I can think about pre-procedural evaluation, procedure itself, and aftercare, and the follow-up. Um, so starting with the uh, pre-procedural evaluation, uh, before performing a biopsy, uh, we must develop a plan to achieve optimal outcomes and minimize complications. Uh, therefore, we need a during pre-procedural evaluation um, and, and, and in, in my opinion, uh, this, this process, if it is not uh, more important, it is as important as the procedure itself. And we often spend more time on the pre-procedural evaluation than the procedure itself. Um, uh, this stage includes assessing indications and contra contraindications, reviewing imaging workup, um, determining biopsy approach, um, imaging guidance modality, appropriate biopsy needle type, and the need for sedation. And um, we're going to go over each step. So um, uh, starting with uh, evaluation for indication. So among all the steps, um, establishing that if the biopsy is, in, is indicated is one of the most important ones. Um, uh, I apologize. This is a busy slide listing major indications and contraindications for biopsy. But essentially, biopsy is indicated when definitive diagnosis cannot be made using imaging only. Uh, and those lesions are usually um, are more aggressive or indeterminate, um, and they can be metastatic lesions. Um, in addition to that, we also do biopsy for assessment of the treatment response, uh, genetic profiling, and molecular, molecular evaluation of the histologically known primary and metastatic tumors. And that is basically to guide for individualized cancer treatment and for enrollment in clinical trials that we are actually, we've been seeing this, this trend um, uh, more commonly. Contraindications for biopsy are usually uncommon, including a target that is uh, percutaneous, percutaneously inaccessible because of the lack of safe trajectory and non-cooperative patients, uh, uncorrected bleeding tendency, and 
um, if there is an active overlying soft tissue infection. Um, so uh, when I personally receive a referral for the biopsy, I like to be able to answer three main questions. One is, uh, is it a suspicious or indeterminate mass? Can I make the diagnosis without the biopsy? And that requires reviewing the clinical history and imaging. Second is, can I biopsy this lesion safely? And that depends on the location of the lesion. What are the surrounding structures like nerves, vessels, and other organs? And finally, can patient tolerate the procedure? Does patient have um, certain comorbidities or certain body habits which can preclude the correct positioning or Tolerating, tolerating the procedure. For instance, some patients may not be able to tolerate prone position uh, that you may need for, for your biopsy. So um, I found these three questions very important. And when, whenever I am able to answer these three, um, I probably have done majority of my pre-procedural -pre 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 evaluation. Um, so let's take a look at the case and a question for the audience response. This is gonna be your first question. Um, we received a referral for biopsying this lesion in the right paraspinal muscle. And uh, the question will follow, but I'm just going to give you a few seconds uh, for you to look at these two images. This is an axial T2 and an axial T1 at the level of the mass. Again, this is T2, this is T1. And next, I'm going to the question. So what's the best next step uh, to proceed to biopsy, uh, to do follow-up MRI in three months, to review uh, prior or obtain CT or request a PET, a PET CT? Um, I'll give you a few seconds. Answers are trickling in and very good. Majority of you um, answered the right, um, picked the right answer, which is the review of the prior or obtained CT. And um, here is the reason. If you look at the MRI uh, of the T2, you will notice that this lesion is not really T2 hyperintense, which is not typical for most of the tumors. In addition to that, there is a low a signal rim around the mass. And when we see that, uh, we have to think about what is, what is dark on, on MR, including calcification, fibrosis, uh, blood products, um, depending on the age. But um, the fact that this is low on T2 with that rim of low signal made us think about uh, maybe we have to obtain a CT. And the CT patient had a CT prior CT from three years prior to this MRI, which showed the mass nicely with um, peripheral ossification. The mass was also un, uh, uh, unchanged in size. All in all, everything is uh, ma made us more confident to basically make a diagnosis of myositis uh, with without the need for biopsy. So we did not really need to do the biopsy of this lesion. The next case also is uh, have another question for you. And uh, this lesion in the um, right iliac bone and uh, predominantly sclerotic. Uh, I'm showing you T1 and then on a CT and both T1, you notice that there is an area which has a little bit of different signal and uh, density on CT. And I will show you a zoomed in image with an ROI. And I hope that you can see the ROI of the Hansville unit, which I can read it for you in case you're not, you're not be able to see it. And it's minus 43. And the question for you is, which one is true? Uh, biopsy is indicated with no further imaging needed. Um, P is the, this is liposarcoma uh, and biopsy is not required. The lesion is almost 100% benign, PET CT before biopsy. And while people are answering uh, that question, Mohammed, I, I can't uh, help but emphasize how important it is to review um, any and all imaging that relates to the area that's being requested. Even if it's a radiograph, um, those can be helpful to review. And you know, go back as many years as you need to. Um, do everything you can to get whatever imaging is available um, and to review that area. Um, I mean, there's several times uh, you know, a month that we actually 
are able to call the ordering physician and say, you know, this patient does not need a biopsy. It's either, you know, it was hot on PET CT, but it was just a bone har um, graft harvest site in the ileum. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a big enhancing lesion, you know, in the uh, that's invaded or um, kind of in the proximal humeral head, but it's just calcific tendinosis that's kind of eroded into the bone. And, you know, comparing to a shoulder radiograph can kind of show that. So, I mean, these are just a few cases that we've had um, in the past few years where we've been able to say, hey, you know, we don't need to do a biopsy. This is a benign process. So very important to, to always review that prior imaging in detail, any and all possible imaging from that's pertinent to the area in question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, these are all real examples. Believe me, if you're going to uh, pra practice MSK, you're going to see all these cases and possibilities and requests for biopsy. And uh, the old saying for the radiologist is your old, oldest, the best friend is the prior. So go back as long as you can and take a look if this is a new lesion or not. So very good majority, almost all of you um, uh, 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 selected the right answer. So this is an intraosseous mass with uh, no Im ag aggressive imaging features. There's no cortical breakthrough, no cortical destruction. And the fact that this has an inside um, fatty fo focus um, and uh, studies have shown that um, it, a mass, intraosseous mass with internal fat with no aggressive features is 99%, almost 100% benign. So again, this is a lesion which do, the, really does not need biopsy. Although I have to tell you, and I, I, I wonder if Hillary um, had also the same uh, experience, oftentimes you cannot win the argument. And sometimes for patients or surgeons reassurance, we end up doing a biopsy, despite the fact that we are almost certain that this is not a concerning lesion. And yes, we ended up doing a biopsy and pathologists showed um, no evidence of malignancy. This was probably a fibroosseous lesion or fibrous dysplasia. Yes, I mean, yes, we certainly do do biopsies of things that we know are benign just based on the imaging. And that's for patient reassurance. You know, this usually in cases where the patient um, was given an, an original interpretation where malignancy was suspected. And, uh, you know, they just need that peace of mind to know, hey, you know, one person read it this way, even though you're saying it's benign, I just, I need that reassurance. And that's, that's definitely a legitimate reason to do it. Um, you know, these biopsies are so safe that, you know, you're not really bringing on any significant harm to the patient um, by doing it and just giving them that, that peace of mind. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we're moving on to the next step in the pre-procedural evaluation, which is reviewing imaging workup. And honestly, we have already started our imaging review when we want to establish if the biopsy is indicated. But for this step specifically, I'm focusing on imaging review for procedural planning. Uh, we, you can use anatomical imaging. Obviously, you start with the radiograph for every single bone lesion that you see. Um, I think radiograph is probably the most important modality. Um, for bone lesions, um, for soft tissues as well, depending on uh, whether or, or not you may consider some internal matrix, uh, CT, MRI, and then moving on to metabolic imaging, such as bone scan or combined anatomic and meta metabolic imaging, such as PET and CT or PET MRI. Uh, combined met metabolic anatomical imaging is particularly useful for detecting lesions that may be occult on anatomical imaging alone. And uh, when there are several lesions, you always have to plan uh, the, sa the safest and the one which is likely to result in the highest yield of diagnostic diagnosis. Uh, and for that, you can use the met metabolic imaging, for example, PET-CT, to see which, imaging which, which lesion has the highest FDG avidity, or you can look at your MRI with contrast to see for any which, which part of the lesion or which lesion has enhancement. And also always, as we mentioned, look at the prior study to see new lesions and identify the old ones. Uh, so here's an example of a patient. Uh, this patient has a, a breast cancer, which was diagnosed in 1997. Um, she had bilateral mastectomy and subsequent hormonal therapy back then, uh, recently presented with new back pain. As, as you can see, there are multiple um, uh, mixed sclerotic and, and lytic lesions. Um, and uh, when you look at the FDG um, avidity, really a uh, majority of those sclerotic lesions do not have any FDG avidity. So these are probably um, treated um, metastatic disease that if you would 
target probably is not going to answer your questions. However, we decided to go after the lesion, which is more lytic, involving the left side of the sacrum, which was FDG Abbott, and the and the biopsy result came back uh, positive for a recurrent metastatic breast cancer carcinoma. So, Mohammed, um, just real quick, I'm just wondering if you have experienced this as well, but you know, sometimes ordering physicians and someone who has multiple metastases like that patient you just showed, they'll actually um, request in their order a specific lesion um, that they want you to target for whatever reason it may be. But oftentimes in your review of the images, you're like, that's not the best lesion to go after. And, you know, in, in our um, practice, we often will change the, the target lesion based on either a PET CT, like showing different or more avid uptake, or it's just a safer approach or, you know, whatever it may be. Most of the time we try and communicate that with the ordering clinician and they're always very supportive, but just wanted to know what your, your experience is with that. Uh, exactly. It's, it's, it does happen. Um, I would say quite often. And, um, they, uh, I think maybe they sometimes um, take a look at the images or they go with the patient's uh, complaint and maybe they have some reports from outside. But um, luckily we are um, working in an area that everyone is pretty welcoming. Uh, and they, uh, we always obviously reach out to them after reviewing the, uh, the studies. And you always wanna do the best for the patient as well as the clinician. So um, when we think that uh, there is a better lesion and oftentimes, they may choose a lesion which is probably more risky. For, for instance, um, if this patient also had a legal lesion in the spine and had this lesion in the bony pelvis, we always go with the pelvis because pelvis is less, um, less risky. Right. Um, so, uh, and uh, probably uh, easier for patient to tolerate. So yeah, exactly, we have the same yeah. experience. So it's just a good point to make to, you know, our residents and fellows that, you know, you know, it's good to be a doctor and take, you know, take that ownership of your patient. And even though another doctor might be, you know, saying do a particular lesion, you can, you can change that. And it's, you don't have to do exactly what that ordering physician says, you know, you are the patient's doctor now and you have to take care of them and do the best, the best thing for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be part of, we are going to be part of patient's care. So we have to basically um, use our expertise to help the patient and our clinicians. They really rely on us. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, the uh, biopsy approach planning. Um, again, for this stage, also the uh, review of pre 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 the imaging before the procedure is so important. And I remember always that uh, the shortest distance is not always the, uh, the best option. And uh, for that, we're gonna go to the next case. So um, this is another case for you uh, and for the audience response. This is a woman, uh, again, with a history of breast cancer, which was diagnosed back in 2005. A uh, patient um, had a um, right second rib lesion that you can see here. And uh, if you look at the 2017 to 2021, this lesion has grown slightly. So it is not very typical for the um, you know, for a metastatic disease to, to have a, great, a growth rate at that, that, that uh, pace. But again, it definitely has clinical the imaging features which are suspicious. There's a cortical destruction, a little bit of maybe soft tissue component. And we were asked to do the biopsy. And I wanted to uh, ask uh, the audience, audience about what would be the best approach for this uh, rib biopsy. And um, I would, when I go to the poll slide, just um, just remember the order of the um, approaches number one, two, and three, because on that slide, unfortunately, I couldn't get the number, so I apologize. So again, one, two, three, and here is the poll. Wow, very good. Okay. Good, not even a uh, wrong question, a wrong, wrong answer. Very good, um, impressive. So exactly. Um, uh, one thing about the, doing a biopsy and planning, you always want to think ahead. And uh, the, think, the thinking about it is basically, what if things go wrong? And if, the, if, if anything is gonna go wrong, then how can you uh, minimize the damage? Or how, how can you avoid? So first of all, uh, one thing about the rib is basically um, the rib biopsies are difficult, specifically if the overlying cortex is intact. There is a chance that you might your needle might slip off the off the rib. 
And for that, um, then you want to think what 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 happens if I my my lead my my needles coming uh, through uh, number one and number two trajectory, and if I slip off the bone, there's a chance that my needle will penetrate the, the lung and cause pneumothorax. So if for the rib lesions, uh, ideally um, you the tra trajectory parallel to the rib is preferred whenever it's possible. It's not going to make your life easier. Uh, it makes, makes your life more difficult to land on the bone, but it is definitely safest. And that's why, why rib lesions are difficult and challenging. The other things about number approach number one and then number two, you want to look at the other structures you are trying to uh, traverse through. And as um, all of you notice probably that there is a subclavian neurovascular bundle, which is running here, you definitely want to avoid them. Uh, so these are the things that um, you want to consider before proceeding with the biopsy. And that's what we did. And the pathology came back as metastatic breast carcinoma. Um, so the, uh, the approach also may, may, may differ when we have a possible primary bone lesion rather than metastatic lesion. And I want basically to... Um, to emphasize on a very important concept for the primary bone tumors in the pelvis, pelvic bone, shoulder, and lower extremity, um, there is a limb sparing definitive surgery. Uh, and that means the surgeon uses a standard surgical approach for tumor resection, uh, which also include resection of the percutaneous biopsy tract. Uh, the biopsy tract is typically resected on block by most surgeons um, because of the assumption that tumor cells may be seated along the path, path of the needle. So an appropriate choice of biopsy trajectory by, by us radiologists really may limit treatment options. Uh, it might actually in the interfere with the limb salva surgery, may sometimes result in amputation uh, or cause more morbidities. Uh, this is usually not a concern for metastatic disease because they are not, they really will undergo surgical resection. So that highlight the importance of uh, the planned biopsy approach should be reviewed with our referring oncology surgeons all the time. And for those who are interested, I highly recommend this article. I, we, we try to refer this article again and again. Um, this is from the radiographics, uh, which provides the detailed descriptions of the appropriate biopsy trajectory considering the standard compartmental anatomy and the appropriate surgical approach. Um, they have listed all the potential uh, locations of the tumors and how to approach them. For example, when the lesion is the greater um, trochanter or in the femoral neck, uh, you want to avoid uh, going to uh, greater trochanter bursa. Or when the lesion is in the femur, a femoral shaft, you want to avoid rectus femoris and vastus intermedius for um, basically the importance of these muscles that they have in the lower extremity um, function and, uh, and patient's uh, uh, functionality. Um, so spine lesions should get special considerations. Um, spinal biopsies should be approached with caution because obviously there are very important structures, the spinal cord, nerve roots, and vessels. Um, there, are very, uh, there are different approaches for the vertebral body biopsies depending on the level of the involvement and where the lesion is in the vertebral body. But mainly um, uh, the uh, transcostal vertebral, which is mainly you can use it for the thoracic uh, vertebral body biopsies, which you insert the needle between the space or you actually creating a space between the, uh, the rib and the transverse uh, and, the, and the pedicle and the transverse process. The transpedicular, which uh, has its name, it goes through the pedicle, and the posterior lateral, which you pre pretty much going through the uh, posterior lateral margin of the uh, vertebral body through the soft tissues. Um, so for this lesion in the thoracic spine, which is predominantly lytic with a pathologic fracture, we were asked to do biopsy, and we decided obviously to go through uh, a trans costal vertebral jaw plane that you can see here. And notice in a single axial image, you'll not be able to see the whole needle because oftentimes for this for the um, spine biopsies, we have to come off plane, always uh, either going uh, cranial or disc or, or, or caudal, basically to make sure we're avoiding certain structures, facets, and on multiple uh, sagittal images, you can see the needle is coming and uh, is in the center of the lesion. Um, 
And um, next step would be choice of imaging guidance. Uh, and uh, that depends on several factors, including uh, the target lesion, anatomical location, um, the operator preference, and availability of the uh, imaging equipment. So um, CT is, general, is generally used for nearly all bone biopsies because of its excellent uh, you know, spatial localization of the lesion and the lesion's relationship with surrounding structures. Um, is also used for deep soft tissue masses and often um, those lesions which, is, um, which are heterogeneous biphys biphysic or multiphasic masses, uh, when those areas are better seen on CT than ultrasound. And when I say biphysic or multiphasic, you often um, face a soft tissue mass which has multiple areas which have different imaging characteristics. And for, for instance, if you look at a small cell, um, um, mixed liposarcoma, it may come up, uh, you may have a lipoid component, you may have a mixoid component, and then you may have a more solid enhancing component. And oftentimes, it, sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate these three on ultrasound, especially if the lesion is deep. So CT is probably a better modality for those. Um, but ultrasound is typically used for majority of the soft tissue masses and some bone lesions with extra osseous soft tissue component. The advantage of ultrasound obviously include lack of radiation, real-time needle guidance. You can localize the small lesions and you can visualize the viable tumor using the Doppler imaging. Um, so here is a, an example of a patient uh, with history of elbow pain. Um, and uh, you notice that um, patient on radiograph, on the lateral radiograph, there is some expansion of the joint capsule and then there is a area of uh, mineralized density or um, um, ossific density sitting in front of the uh, elbow joint. Patient had an MRI done, which showed a mass, uh, intraarticular mass uh, uh, with a more mass-like uh, component anteriorly, and uh, there's some diffuse synovitis in the, in the joint. So when we think about an intraarticular mass, we obviously want to think about, you know, inflammatory or flopathy, obviously, like um, rheumatoid arthritis, but then, um, you want to think about no plastic or metaplastic processes um, such as, you know, synovial um, chondromatosis or synovial osteochondromatosis or PVNS. Uh, we were thinking about PVNS, but what is very unusual for PVNS is calcification. Uh, some people think that if you see calcification, you can probably exclude PVNS. So we were not sure what are we dealing with. So uh, they asked us to do the biopsy. So we chose to do an ultrasound. And uh, so we uh, put the probe um, just anterior to uh, the elbow joint. And we decided to go um, from the side and ultrasound. We chose ultrasound because it um, let us do real time advancement of the needle while identifying different structures around the elbow and anterior to the elbow, including, uh, you know, median nerve, radial nerve and, and, and arteries. And uh, we biopsied both a non ossific and ossific component. And as you can see, the pathology shows PVNS with chondroid metaplasia. And the chondroid metaplasia is the area that has calcification. So here's another lesson. So if you see a lesion everywhere in the, in the muscular skeleton that is, um, has multiple different imaging characteristics or components, you ideally want to do to send samples for those components separately. Uh, for instance, you see a, an enchondroma in the proximal humerus um, which has a, a focal area which um, is more aggressive, has some cortical thinning or cortical destruction. What we normally do, we take samples of the more normal looking enchondroma, and then we take samples of that region. We often send them in a separate formalin uh, containers because that allows pathology, pathologists to basically make the, make the diagnosis of the underlying lesion and also looking at those areas which is atypical uh, can help the pathologist to decide where basically there is a dedifferentiated uh, component um, associated with that lesion. Um, okay, let's move on to the selecting biopsy needle. Um, in terms of biopsy needle, we almost always use coaxials for different reasons. One is to minimize the potential tumor seeding along the biopsy path. Uh, to diminish um, any potential injury uh, to non-target tissues along the needle trajectory when several specimens are obtained and also improve procedure efficacy by maintaining access via the introducer. 
Uh, these bone biopsy coaxial systems have an outer axis needle uh, made up of a um, cannula and an inner penetrating needle, um, commonly a diamond tip, um, that um, allows purchase into or crossing of the cortex and access to the intermedial lesion. The biopsy component is a uh, kind of a trephine a type hollow uh, biopsy needle, which is placed inside um, through the outer working cannula after removing the inner penetrating needles to capture osseous tissue. Um, calibers of the coaxial bone biopsy needles uh, system vary and can be as large as 10 to 12 gauge. Generally, we try to choose the largest needle gauge that allows us to do biopsy safely and uh, get, get, uh, get good cores. And then ultimately you have a pusher, which will allow you to um, push the specimen outside the uh, biopsy needle. Examples of some bone needle systems, uh, which include, you know, um, uh, Bonopti, Lorraine, Jamshiri, and then uh, the battery powered one, which uh, uncontrolled different um, uh, vendors. It really depends on where you practice and what you, are you comfortable with. For the soft tissue mass biopsy, we also use coaxial systems, but uh, most of the devices have a cutting trough or a tray, as you can see here. Um, they often can be as long as 2.5 uh, 2 centimeter to, that allows us to capture the specimen. There are two main biop soft tissue biopsy needles or, or devices. The spring loaded, which release the cannula and a stylet in a rapid sequence and captures the tissue sample with the push of a button. Uh, so do you, for, if you're using those, you definitely want to make sure you have enough clear space distally when you want to take the, the, um, the biopsy. The one that I personally prefer is the uh, delayed firing, uh, which, is, uh, which does allow you to advance the stylet first and let the tissue settle in the tray. You can verify and document the stylet position if you're doing an under ultrasound, and then you can activate the cutting, cutting cannula. Um, the uh, calibers uh, for the soft tissue biopsy needles vary also from 14 to 22 gauge. And again, most majority of our biopsy soft, for soft tissue biopsies, we use the 14 gauge uh, devices. It is very important to remember that the distal end of most of the soft tissue biopsy needles have a two to three millimeter non-cutting tip or a dead zone. Uh, this part is not gonna collect any specimen. And this is not really important in large lesions. But if you think about doing a small lesion, it is very important to, to remember that because doing a biopsy of a small lesion, you, uh, as you see here, uh, you may sometimes not gonna get enough tissue if your dead zone is inside. And what you can do, you can often push the needle and um, push the, the other, the dead zone to the other end of the lesion and then get your tray centered in the lesion and get a good core. Again, you wanna make sure you can see clearly on the other side of lesion, then there is no other structures uh, that you may get damaged. Mohammed, I have a question for you. So, if you um, have, say, a, a lesion that's you know greater than two centimeters, do you just always use a fourteen gauge? And then, what do you do if it's under two centimeters? Um, do you kind of just depend on where it is and whether you go from China to a smaller gauge needle or not? Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, if we think that uh, we can uh, take the sample safely, or uh, we can um, we can put the tray so that the tray is going to be in the the, the lesion is going to fall in the center of the tray, while we can see the other on uh, uh, the other side of the lesion clearly, we may try to do it 14 gauge with a two centimeter uh, throw. Uh, but you know, for smaller lesions, deeper lesions, for instance, um, we definitely can go to a smaller gauge, 16 gauge, um, rarely go to uh, anything smaller than that. Okay. And oftentimes for very small lesions, uh, we all sometimes can just do FNA. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. We, um, we actually at our um, institution, we don't really have the option for a 16 gauge for some reason. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes for like one centimeter lesions will go to an 18 gauge um, for those, but, you know, just take more samples of it, um, you know, multi-directional, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, usually we get a diagnosis. So yeah. we routinely use 14 gauge for, for anything bigger than that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we also try to, uh, to use 14 gauge. Um, we recently got a 12 gauge um, 
uh, soft tissue needles. They're, they're, they're really nice, but- I bet um, your pathologists the, love that even more. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay, so, um, and the next, uh, maybe the last step in the pre-procedural pre 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 evaluation is the pain management. Um, uh, most bone biopsies are performed, um, you know, in our institution, we use a combination of moderate sedation with local anesthesia. A lot of times, um, or I would say oftentimes, you, we can just perform the bone biopsy with local anesthetic, um, uh, but oftentimes we have to uh, consider uh, moderate sedation. Uh, we reserve general anesthesia for more complex procedures, longer procedures, or depending on the lesion, for example, osteoidosteomas, uh, can be very painful, so we do them under general anesthesia or for, or for pediatric patients. And for the for the soft tissue, we mainly use local anesthetic. Uh, for lesions uh, which look like arising from the nerve, such as nerve sheet tumor, we try we consider doing a proximal nerve block in addition to the local anesthetic. And, and Hillary, are you? Um, I, I'm curious that. Um, how, how often do you guys use um, moderate sedation for um, for the bone biopsies? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, my answer to that is almost never do we use moderate sedation oh, wow. okay. um, for bone biopsies. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've I've had one case um, since I've been on staff for the last almost twelve years. I can't believe it. Um, where I tried to do a tibial biopsy in a young, healthy patient um, under moderate sedation and. She complained uh, quite loudly, um, you know, trying to use the on control through thick cortex um, was not so fun for her, um, but she ended up tolerating it well. She was a little angry with me after, but I, in all the biopsies that I've done over the last 12 years, I've never had another one where I've gotten a significant um, complaint. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's funny. I, you, I mean, I think it, it makes the patient's more comfortable and probably the clinician's more comfortable to use moderate sedation if you routinely do. And, you know, everyone in my practice has um, uh, moderate sedation privileges, so we can all give it. Um, but I think, you know, our referring physicians are used to us not using it, so they don't prep the patients to expect it. And, you know, the patients are really just expecting local anesthesia. So that kind of helps where we have that relationship with our orthopedic surgeons and, mm -hmm. you know, other mm -hmm. clinicians that, uh, you know, the patients know when they come, they're just going to get the local anesthesia. Yeah, so some that. of our bone marrow biopsy patients, though, I think they're kind of used to getting a little bit more um, in the oncologist. We had to have a couple sit downs with them over the past year, just kind of reinforcing the fact that we only use um, local anesthesia, uh, but that's actually gone um, pretty well um, as of late of the last few months. So it's interesting you mentioned the TBO because uh, I just wanted to show you the, uh, one example that was my personal experience as well. This was a, a young male with right leg pain, um, which um, had a sclerotic lesion in the tibia. And uh, we, we started the biopsy on a local anesthetic and moderate sedation. And once we entered the lesion with the biopsy needle, the patient was in substantial pain. And even we increased the dose of moderate sedation, he was not able to tolerate. So really what we got was a small bone with, from the cortex. We were not able to complete the, uh, the biopsy. We aborted it and then patient came back and we had it done under general anesthesia. And to Hiller's point is that um, I, we have also experienced that um, sclerotic lesions in the long bones, specifically in the lower extremity and specifically in the tibia, are more sensitive and uh, more painful. So we have a lower threshold to consider the moderate sedation and sometimes to do a general anesthesia for these cases. Okay, so um, now moving to the biopsy procedure itself. Um, it is very important to make yourself and the patient uh, reasonably comfortable because to, uh, you wanna achieve the optimal and safe access to your target. Um, obviously, <clears throat> biopsy should be performed under a sterile condition. There are certain precautions depending on where you want to do the biopsy. For example, emptying the bladder immediately before uh, biopsying this uh, parasympathetic pubic bone. We monitor patients continuously for the pain and then we address the discomfort by increasing the local anesthetic. And if patient is under moderate sedation, we can increase the dosage of fentanyl and midazolam or other agents that uh, can be used.
sorry, a little bit of delay in advancing my slides. Okay, I uh, just wanted to show you an example here. And apologize. Okay, very good. So uh, here's, let's look at a few examples. This is a uh, young female with an enhancing solid mass posterior to the knee with a non-enhancing T2 hyperintense uh, center, such as above necrosis and ultrasound confirmed that. We were asked to biopsy this mass and we decided to do this um, uh, under biopsy, under ultrasound. So my question for you is that by touching the screen, this patient is prone. So this is answer is a posterior. Show me where you think would be the best place to uh, place the needle. And I hope it works. Um, okay, yeah, I can see some. Okay, I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. Okay, very good. All right, perfect. So let's take a look. So again, is this really important to think about the surgical approach when um, uh, surgeons wants to resect the mass and mostly in the, and mostly in the extremity, the incision is going to be longitudinal overlying the mass. Um, and like the red uh, uh, line here on the axial, uh, is, is incision is gonna be right there. So if you place the probe over the lesion in the short axis, the biopsy entry and track are not going to be in the expected location of the surgical incision. And that sometimes force surgeons to do more resection further away from the surgical incision. Uh, so in these cases, the best, uh, best is to place the probe in the long axis. Uh, along the superior margin of the lesion. So the biopsy skin entry uh, would be in the region of a surgical incision. Also in masses where there is an area of necrosis, again, we want to make sure that uh, we um, take biopsies from the uh, non-necrotic non area. We'd also want to take some samples from necrotic area because presence of necrosis can change the pathologic rating of the mass. And I just wanted to share with you the French uh, histologic grading of the uh, soft tissue sarcomas. And if you, as you notice, the tumor necrosis, uh, presence of tumor necrosis can uh, um, change the grading of the tumor. So uh, in our practice, we uh, always try to take at least one sample, one core sample from the interface of the solid mass and the necrotic area. Um, here is another example of a young patient with history of prior uh, lumbar pain decompression infusion. Uh, he presented with new, new back pain and uh, had a remote history of TB. His recent MRI and CT were uh, suspicious for infection with uh, possible intraosseous collection and also uh, osteolysis around the, around the hardware. Uh, spine surgeon wanted us to do the biopsy. And we normally use the transpedicular approach here. But as you can see, there is a screw in the pedicle. And at that time, we were also concerned going uh, through posterior lateral approach because of the scar tissue and the possible neural damage. So we discussed our approach, our approach with the spine surgeon, and then we basically decided to place a larger introducer just close to the pedicle and then advance a smaller biopsy needle coaxially through the lucency around the screw. And we managed to pass that smaller lesion all the way uh, get the biopsy sample, and also we aspirated that fluid. It, it gave us uh, enough fluid to send, and uh, ultimately aspiration showed acid fast bacilli. And uh, biopsy sometimes is done in conjunction with therapeutic uh, procedures such as ablation. Um, in these cases, uh, biopsy approach should be adjusted um, based on the, uh, the planned treatment. Uh, here in a 15-year-old with back pain and progressive scoliosis, MRI is showing some non-specific edema-like signal of the L3 and L4 pedicles. There was no other abnormality seen on prior prospectively. Therefore, CT was ordered. And I'm showing you the CT axial and sagittal. And here is another question for you. What is the most likely diagnosis? Infection, stress fracture, osteodosioma, osteochondroma. Wow, we're really uh, having a great audience here. Um, 
Very good. So yes, that was um, CT showed a cortical base lesion in the tip of the superior artical process of the L4 compared with osteoma. We were asked to do the biopsy and RFA, and we approached this pedicle uh, through the pedicle, avoiding the facet joints. And uh, we did the biopsy. Then we placed our RFA probe inside the lesion and starting the um, RI radiofrequency ablation. In addition, we, we uh, placed another spinal needle uh, to um, um, uh, into the epidural space near the exiting L3 nerve root and through which we slowly injected cold dextrose during uh, the radiofrequency ablation to, pre to protect the spinal nerve and the fecal sac, and this patient did really well. Um, so in terms of uh, um, achieving highest um, diagnostic yield. There are many factors associated with that. Um, some of them are technical, they're related to what we do, and some of them inherent to the lesion. For, for instance, osteolytic lesions and tumor larger, two, larger than two centimeter have higher yield, uh, while um, higher number and length of the core samples are associated with higher diagnostic yield. We uh, classically uh, try to get at least three core samples when largest gauge, uh, with the largest gauge needle possible. And I'm sorry, and I apologize that I'm going a little bit over, um, and I hope it's okay. I think I'll be done within a few minutes, if that's okay. All right. Yeah, Hillary said uh, I can probably finish it. Okay, good. Um, in terms of specimen handling, um, for the interest of time, I'm going to probably skip this, but just know that uh, for the majority of the surgical pathology, we use 10-person uh, uh, formalin. RPMI for our, uh, for flow cytometry if we're suspecting myeloma and lymphoma. Um, complications are rare, um, less than 5%. Um, bleeding and hematoma are the most common ones. And honestly, most of these complications can be avoided with good and well thought planning and patient screening. But just as always, you have to expect to um, uh, think about and predict that. And just you have to be comfortable enough to deal with them with the majority of them if they occur. And finally, once the biopsy is done, most patients are discharged after a short period of observation. Uh, you wanna make sure they're reasonably comfortable. And the last but not least, the operating radiologist should review surgical pathology reports uh, for two reasons. One, to make sure the results are con concordant with the pre-procedural imaging, and if not, then you want to discuss it with the referring physician and the pathologist to make additional plan, which could be repeat biopsy or open biopsy. And also follow up uh, of your own biopsy is probably the greatest way to improve your diagnostic and procedural skills. Uh, the final question for you is there's a sternal lesion when which statement is correct. Um, or uh, which is the best biopsy approach number one number two, number three, and this is a very risky biopsy and should not be done under imaging. I'm glad that no one, great, okay. I'm glad that no one chose number one. Um, okay, cool. Um, yes, and so um, for the external lesions, pretty much like the rib lesions, you wanna think about what if my needle is slips or went through the cortex on the other side, and definitely you don't wanna go into this structure here. So for that, you can come a little bit oblique and uh, take the time to get a good purchase on the cortex. If you're gonna be oblique, it will, it will take longer. Um, I mean, there's, you know, you can pretty much come vertically, but um, I think probably going oblique a little bit more, a little bit safer. And the last case I wanna share with you is again, to highlight how important it is to review the pre procedural imaging. This was a 79 year old man with painful shoulder mass. They wanted us to do biopsy of this lesion. You see there is a, uh, destructive soft tissue mass overlying the shoulder and the shoulder joint on MR. Um, that, that there are some areas of high T1 signal internally and also uh, heterogeneous on T2. What was striking to us is the presence of that much motion artifact. And that is really not the motion of the shoulder because you really don't see the motion involving the shoulder joint, rather this is the mass. And that made us concerned that probably this, we are dealing with a possible very uh, vascular vascular mass. We suggested CT artery, arteriogram to just make sure we're not going into something which we're not supposed to go and which nicely showed the pseudoaneurysm in the shoulder joint, which was ultimately treated for with uh, by our, by our, um, And again, that emphasized how important it is to evaluate the imaging well. So in summary, 
The goal of MSK biopsy is often to obtain diagnostic tissue when indicated in a safe manner. You want to coordinate with your refer referring surgeon when needed. Select best imaging modality to see the lesion and adjacent structures. Choose best biopsy device and best technique to obtain best quality samples. Target the high yield areas as well as underlying primary and necrotic tissue and expect, assess, and also know how to treat complications and always, always, always remember to follow up your results. And with that, I wanna thank you so much for your attention. So um, Dr. Samin, we have one question from um, the attendees. Uh, any advice on getting adequate samples for lesions like giant cell tumor? Uh, Hillary, can you say, uh, can you just repeat the question? Yes, any advice on getting adequate samples for lesions like giant cell tumor? And um, I'm wondering if when they say giant cell tumor, they're referring to the giant cell tumor of the bone or giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. Um, they don't specify, but um, maybe comment on both. I don't know. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, I would like also to uh, see what you think, but for the giant cell tumor of the bone, uh, majority of those that we see are um, decent size. And um, we do not really have too much of a problem obtaining the samples. Um, the majority are not that um, cellular, so we really do not have to target a specific area. Unless they're, uh, we're dealing with the recurrence, then they will have to really think, look very carefully at the image and target those lesions. For the giant cell tumor of the tendon sheet, I, I, I agree, sometimes they're hard. Uh, they might be in a tricky position in the hand, on the wrist you really do not have too much room to wiggle about. So, and oftentimes you have to go with the smaller needle as Hillary suggested. Oftentimes you go with a 16 gauge or um, again, 18 gauge I've rarely used, but, um, and again, you can just change your uh, tray of your soft tissue needle. So if I show you, uh, if we go back to that slide that showed it to tray, um, and remember that you're dealing with something 3D or spherical. So if you put your needle biopsy inside the lesion and take one sample, you can always go back and rotate your tray and get the sample from another uh, location of the lesion. Um, and that also you can go with the smaller tray and instead of 2.5 centimeter, use one, uh, one centimeter just to be safe. Yeah, I, I mean, what I typically that. tell um, our residents and fellows to do is just to kind of treat it like a clock face and go, you know, at 12 and then three and then six and then nine if they want to okay. do four samples. But if it's pretty adequate on the first two, you know, maybe just do, you know, 12 and three and then you're done. Um, it just kind of depends. Um, we do have cytology in the room with us, so they kind of tell us the adequacy of our Lucky. samples. Um, I know we're spoiled <laughs> <laughs> real time. So, uh, but I know I've, not everyone has that, uh, that advantage. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samin. That was excellent. Such great cases, particularly with that last one. Oh my gosh, that's uh, that's really really scary um, yeah. to think that you know the possibility of biopsying an enormous pseudoaneurysm. Uh, so yeah, really nicely emphasized the importance of reviewing the prior imaging there. Uh, and thank you so much to our audience um, for joining us tonight and learning a little bit more about the wonderful specialty of musculoskeletal radiology. Um, we do have another lecture next month, um, specifically on March 16th, uh, starting at, again at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the topic is kind of interesting. Um, it's uh, titled Private Practice, Academia, and the MSK Radiology Job Market Outlook. Um, so for you fellows and residents out there, this might be particularly interesting for you. Uh, the speaker will be Michael Trackenbreut. I probably butchered his last name. I apologize, uh, Michael. But, um, and he's from Houston Methodist Hospital. Um, we hope to see you there. Thank you again so very much and have a good rest of your evening.